American experience. Setha's choke cherry tree scar embodies her traumatic slavery experience in Sweet Home. Whether others are able to share Setha's pain, however, is unclear because Setha never speaks of her trauma since escaping from Sweet Home. As a result, while the scar is horrifically described as back skin, which had been dead for years, those who see it acquire completely different meanings. Amy Denver, who is a runaway white indentured slave, calls the scar a choke cherry tree. Paul D., another former sweet home slave, likens it to an ironsmith's sculpture. Even Setha, who has never seen her own scar, views it ambivalently. She ponders if the tree might be bearing cherries. It is through Paul D.'s curiosity and sympathy towards the back scar that Setha carthetically remembers the abuse, rape, and the separation from a baby. Eighteen years after Setha's escape from the plantation, ironically called Sweet Home, another former Sweet Home slave, Paul D., arrives at 124. Setha sporadically recounts her experiences at Sweet Home and her escape from it. She begins by casually mentioning the tree on her back. The tree arouses Paul D's attention, and he asks her about it. Setha reveals she has never seen it, but is told by the white girl Amy Denver that it looks like a choke cherry tree. She even believes that the tree could have cherries too. She continues sharing her experience, but seems unconsciously to avoid the topic of the tree. Instead, she talks about how she's unable to give her breast milk to the crawling already baby separated from her immediately at birth. Paul D. tries to steer Setha back to the tree, but Setha digresses further. Finally, Setha reveals that the sweet home boys came in there and took my milk, held me down and took it. She connects the tree with the scar. School teacher made one open up my back, and when it closed, it made a tree. With great sympathy and sorrow, Paul D. goes behind Setha and rubs his cheek on her back and learns that the way her sorrow, the roots of it, is wide, trunk, and intricate branches. When he lifts up Setha's dress and sees the scar for the first time, he finds it resembles a sculpture, like the decorative work of an ironsmith too passionate for display. Immediately after Paul D. looks at the scar, the house is again haunted by the mysterious ghost. Paul D. fights back at the ghost and performs a spontaneous exorcism that leaves the house rock quiet. Just as she has never seen the scar herself, Setha never speaks of her trauma after escaping from Sweet Home. The 124 ghost violently haunts the house when Paul D. looks at the scar. Readers can thereby associate Setha's traumatic memories to a form of haunting. To see her choke cherry tree, to remember a trauma, Setha requires the help of others. This pertains to the inexpressible nature of trauma. In Jonathan Safran Foer's post-9-11 novel, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, Thomas Shell Sr. remains tortured by the death of his first fiancée, Anna, and their unborn child in the bombing of Dresden at the end of the World War II. He becomes mute and dependent on a notebook and the yes and no tattoos on his hands to communicate. The incapability of African Americans speaking about the traumas of slavery also echoes Morrison's concerns of how white historical accounts imagine blacks and imagine for blacks. Moreover, the scar's contradictory connotations or readings reveal the contradictions of the slavery experience. On one hand, readers can view the positive connotations to be whipped on the back to the point that a fruit-bearing chokecherry tree or sculpture is formed as exemplifying its horrific origins. On the other hand, the scar reveals the ambiguity of the plantation farm's name Sweet Home. The farm is named by the original slave master, Mr. Garner, who sees his farm as utopian paradise for African-American slaves. He proudly proclaims how at Sweet Home, my niggas is men every one of them. Bought them that away, raised them that away, men every one. He teaches them how to read, never abuses them, and even allows the slaves to buy themselves out of slavery, like the case of Hallie, who works extra hours to buy freedom for his mother, Baby Suggs. Under Mr. Garner's rule, 
Sweet Home is apparently more humane than typical plantation farms. This pertains to how George Fitzhugh and other slavery defenders once argued how the case of the black slaves is now better than that of any equal number of laborers on earth, and is daily improving. And yet, Setha receives her choke cherry tree scar from the Sweet Home slavery plantation. The title character Beloved's ghostly presence is immediately evident. A few weeks after her arrival at 124, Paul D. finds something funny about the gal. He puzzles over why Beloved asks sick, sounds sick, but she don't look sick. Good skin, bright eyes, and strong as a bull. He is also suspicious of the origin of Beloved. She claims to have walked a long, 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 long way to 124, but her shoes are brand new. The longer Beloved stays in 124, the more her grotesqueness materializes. For several nights, Paul D. and Setha, now lovers, sleep at Setha's upstairs bedroom. But when Paul D. wakes in the morning, he is rocking a chair downstairs. He doesn't even remember how he gets there. One night, he even feels compelled to leave the house. He wonders if he's having house fits. Paul D. feels that Beloved had moved him, as if she is trying to move him out of 124. He goes in the storeroom outside of 124 and tries to sleep there. Beloved suddenly appears and seduces him. I want you to touch me on the inside part and call me my name. You have to touch me on the inside part and you have to call me my name. Paul D. resists at first. He eventually succumbs. The underage Beloved and Paul D.'s sexual encounter superficially appears to be scandalous. Yet, readers' expectations are subverted when Paul D. confesses that having sex with Beloved actually helps him face his horrendous slavery experience. She moved closer with the footfall he didn't hear, and he didn't hear the whisper that the flakes of rust made either as they fell away from the seams of his tobacco tin. So when the lid gave, he didn't know it. What he knew was that when he reached the inside part, he was saying, Red Heart, Red Heart over and over again. The tobacco tin is the metaphor Paul D. uses to describe his act of locking up memories and emotions from his enslaved past, which includes being sold to Georgia to work on a chain gang where he experiences torture, abuse, and starvation. When he arrives at 124, his tobacco tin is so tightly closed that nothing in this world could pry it open. But when Paul D. has sex with Beloved, his tobacco tin becomes a red heart again, indicating that his slavery trauma and emotions resurface. Near the end of the novel, Paul D. reveals his gratefulness to Beloved for bringing him to that ocean-deep place where he reconnects with his past traumas. Morrison's decision to use sexual intercourse as the key to heal Paul D.'s slavery traumas is bold. Slavery strips away African-American representative manhood, yet Paul D. regains his manhood after having sex with a beloved. Pro-slavery defenders cite the Old and New Testaments to show that slavery is not inhumane, that the practice is even beneficial. These defenders argue that even prominent biblical figures like Abraham, Isaac, and Job are slaveholders. In this sense, Morrison deconstructs the supremacist Christian Morris in the context of African-American slavery and racism by presenting morally ambiguous situations and luring readers into making moral judgments. She then presents more information thus infinitely complicating our preconceptions. Additional information creates radical ambiguity in the plot. As a result, readers can no longer make any knee-jerk valley judgments. Morris's deconstruction of hegemonic Christian morality is further evident in the sermons of Baby Suggs, who is the mother of Setha's husband, Hallie. As an unchurched preacher, Suggs preaches about self-affirmation and collective reconnection to the mind and body. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms. Strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people, out yonder, hear me, they do not love your neck, unnoosed and straight, so love your neck, 
Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs. You got to love them. The dark, dark liver. Love it, love it. And the beat and beating heart. Love that too. More than eyes or feet. More than lungs that have yet to draw free air. More than your life holding womb and your life giving private parts. Hear me now. Love your heart, for this is the prize. Sugg's preaching stresses a communal love of the flesh as a corrective to post slavery racism. She tells her lovers to touch one another and love every part of their flesh, including their inside parts, because whites do not see blacks as humans. Rather, they see them as sloth for hogs. Most importantly, Sugg's sermon offers an alternative religious belief for blacks. She teaches them to self validate and recognize their humanity by loving heart. Sugg's sermon links physical and sensual pleasures as subversive to the traumas of slavery. The collective love and embrace of the body is perhaps the first step to recovering human dignity and identity after slavery. Beloved seduction of Paul D can be reinterpreted as a means for Paul D to regain his long suppressed masculinity. The repetition of inside part evokes this rereading. The scene that